Hey friends, welcome back to the channel. So we often think that the opposite of distraction is focus, but this isn't actually true. The opposite of distraction is traction. And what's really cool about these two words is that they both end in the same six letters, which means that distraction is any action that pulls you away from your goals and traction is any action that pulls you towards your goals. Now, this is something I came across when I first read the incredible book, Indistractable by Nir Eyal. I've taken a lot of advice from that book myself personally, and I recently had a wonderful conversation with Nir all about how to become indistractable. So we constantly lie to ourselves. And what that means is that we look back on our lives and we are full of regret. We said we should have done that thing. We should have started the business. We should have written the book. We should have started the podcast. We should have started YouTubing, whatever the case might be, but we didn't do it. We got distracted. So being indistractable is about doing what you say you're going to do. Nira is in his 40s now, and he's in an amazing shape with six pack abs. He's got a great family. He thinks very intentionally about what he wants in his life. But it actually took Nir five years to write the book because ironically, he kept on getting distracted. So partly he wrote the book to find out for himself how he could become indistractable, both when doing day-to-day -day tasks and also on big long-term projects. And in this video, we're gonna be breaking down the four key elements of the indistractability model, which is all about doing more traction and less distraction, perhaps unsurprisingly. Principle number one, the 10 minute rule. So a lot of us think that the reason why we're so distracted is because of our phones and emails and work and kids and all of those things around us. But according to Neo's research, this is actually a myth because external triggers only account for around 10% of our distractions. Instead, 90% of our distraction is caused by internal triggers. What are internal triggers? Internal triggers are uncomfortable emotional states that we seek to escape. Boredom, loneliness, fatigue, uncertainty, anxiety. These are these uncomfortable sensations that we look to escape many times with distraction. So the research shows that we are more motivated to avoid pain than we are to seek pleasure. This is something called prospect theory and it explains why you care more about not losing $100 than you do about winning $100. Rationally, it's the same thing. You either win 100 or you don't lose 100, but there's something about losing stuff, experiencing that pain that makes us feel very motivated to avoid that. So like what Nir said, internal triggers are uncomfortable emotional states that we are trying to avoid. And so if we want to become indistractable, we need to get way better at taking control of our internal triggers. And there are loads of techniques that Neo talks about in his book about this, but one of the key ones is the 10 minute rule. The 10 minute rule says that you can give in to any distraction, whatever that distraction might be, whether you're on a diet and you're trying to resist that chocolate cake, whether you're trying to quit smoking, whether you're trying to not check your phone every five minutes when you're trying to be with your family or do a work project, you can give in to that distraction, but not right now in 10 minutes. And if 10 minutes is too long, make it the five minute rule. It doesn't really matter. So next time you feel distracted, try procrastinating from that distraction for just 10 minutes. Now in those 10 minutes, you can do a couple of things. You can firstly choose to get back to whatever you were doing before you got distracted, or alternatively, you can use that time to surf the urge. And this is where we acknowledge that emotions come in waves and you sort of explore why that feeling came about in the first place. And a key action point here is to create what Neo calls a distraction notebook. So most people have no sense of why they got distracted. They all of a sudden find the cigarettes in their hand. They all of a sudden find the phone is, you know, they're scrolling on TikTok or whatever without realizing what was the preceding internal trigger. So a distraction notebook is a way for you to start bringing awareness to what is that preceding emotion that you are trying to escape. He recommends actually doing this on pen and paper or keeping it written down somewhere rather than just doing it in your head, but you can do it in your head if you want. Basically, it's a good way to keep track of those internal triggers that cause you to become distracted. And then obviously you can put steps in place to avoid that thing distracting you again in the future, hopefully. Now in the rest of this video, we're gonna talk about three other things, but if you are the sort of person who gets distracted, you're also probably the sort of person who's not gonna watch the rest of this video. So I'm telling you now, if you just take one thing away from this video, it is to recognize that practically all of the time, 90% of the time, when you're getting distracted, it's because there is some kind of emotional state that you are trying to avoid. And just having that knowledge, that appreciation that you are a little bitch, and <laughs> no, no, not that. And just having that knowledge, <laughs> And just having that knowledge can help you actually figure out, okay, what's the source of that emotion? Why is that emotion happening? What's the narrative you're telling yourself about the emotion? Feelings are not facts, as various people on the internet famously say, which is kind of true. Feelings are not facts. The feeling is caused by some kind of internal sensation, and then you're telling yourself some sort of narrative or some sort of story, which is then precipitating that specific feeling. And that negative emotion is the thing that you're trying to avoid when you get distracted. So if you just remember that, feel free to click off this video, scroll TikTok instead. But if that's the thing that you take away from this video, this video will have been totally worth it. 
But okay, if you're still with me, then we know that internal triggers are not 100% of the problem. There is another 10%. And if we want to solve the other 10% of distraction, then we've got to think about two other causes of distraction. That is firstly, planning problems. And secondly, external triggers. Oh, and by the way, if you are enjoying this video, then you might like to check out Brilliant, who are very kindly sponsoring this video. Brilliant is a fantastic online education platform where you learn by doing, not just by consuming. And they've got thousands of interactive lessons in maths and data analysis, programming, and even AI. I've personally been learning stuff on Brilliant for the last five years, and I've gotten a lot of value from it in helping me understand various things around AI and programming and crypto. And I've even had people in my audience in that time who have said that they started using Brilliant on the various recommendations that I, that I give for it, and they've gotten value out of it as well. They've got a really good first principles approach to learning, which helps you build understanding from the ground up. And it's all crafted by an award-winning team of teachers and researchers and professionals from cool places like MIT, Caltech, Microsoft, Google, and many more places. And really Brilliant helps you build critical thinking skills through problem solving rather than through memorizing things, which is traditionally how we're taught to do stuff in school. So while you're building real knowledge on specific topics, you're also becoming a better thinker. And in just a few minutes each day, which can replace some of the minutes you spent mindlessly scrolling, Brilliant can help you build genuine real world knowledge. The growing number of courses on programming are particularly good, and those can help you get familiar, for example, with Python, which is the world's most popular programming language. And you can start building programs on day one with their built-in drag and drop editor. If any of that sounds interesting and you'd like to try out everything Brilliant has to offer completely for free for a full 30 days, head over to brilliant.org slash aliadal, or you can scan or screenshot the QR code on screen, or you can click on the link in the video description. And if you sign up for Brilliant using any of these mechanisms, you'll also get 20% off the annual premium subscription. So thank you so much, Brilliant, for sponsoring this video. Principle number two, the willpower myth. Okay, so aside from all of these internal triggers, there are lots of other external triggers that also pull us away from traction, like phones and computers and TV shows and work emails and meetings and the whole shebang. And I've made a bunch of videos specifically on how to deal with some of these external triggers like phone addiction and stuff. But one of the really interesting things that Nira and I talked about was willpower and whether or not willpower is really something that runs out towards the end of the day, like some people think it does. So there is this popular notion that willpower is a limited resource. And this came out of some research uh, done uh, several years ago now uh, around this concept called ego depletion. Ego depletion says that we run out of willpower just like we would run out of battery charge on our phone or gas in our gas tank, that it's a depletable resource. And this got a lot of, of, of press because it's kind of a concept people want to believe. This original study on ego depletion was published in 1998 by a psychologist called Roy Baumeister. And a lot of people subscribe to this idea of willpower being a limited resource because it's a comforting thought. It allows us to say that, oh man, I go, I'm just so tired by the end of the day. My willpower has run out. I get so drained at work by my boss or by life or by circumstances or by the weather or by whatever. My willpower has run out. And so I have to watch Netflix in the evening. It's not my fault that I'm not actually making progress on my goals. And instead I'm just scrolling TikTok and Instagram and all that kind of stuff. It's not my fault. It's that my willpower has run out. But it turns out actually that the results from this original 1998 study have been totally debunked. Turns out this idea of ego depletion that we run out of willpower like gas in a gas tank turns out not to be true except in one group of people there is actually one group of people who really do run out of willpower they really do spend it up and those people and only those people and this work was done by carol dweck i'm sure you, you know her work uh, her wonderful book uh, called mindset and she found that the only group of people who run out of willpower are people who believe that willpower is a depletable resource. So if you think that you run out of willpower by the end of the day, then your body and mind will behave in that way. If you just choose to believe that willpower is not a depletable resource, and actually you can always muster up willpower and discipline whenever you feel like it, then it's not really gonna become a problem. The word addiction comes from the Latin addictio, which means slave. So when you say to yourself, I am a slave, I am addicted, I have no more willpower, I'm spent, you're making it true. And so we have to be very, very careful about these labels and make sure that we only adopt the labels that serve us rather than the ones that hurt us. By the way, if you're enjoying this video, then you might like to check out my completely free seven day focus crash course. It's completely free and it's a series of seven emails that I'll send you each day that each have some evidence-based principles, strategies, and tools that you can use to improve your focus as well. And the reason we've put that together is because whenever I pull the audience and ask like, what are you guys struggling with? Focus and like consistency <laughs> seems to be the, the highest thing on that list. 
basically all the time. And so we thought, you know what, let's just turn this into a bit of an email course because there is so much to share and so many strategies that are really helpful when it comes to focus. So if you're interested, it's completely free. You can sign up, you can unsubscribe whenever you want. Head over to focuscrashcourse.com or hit the link in the video description. All right, principle number three is traction time boxing. Everything is a distraction unless you plan your time. So unlike a to-do list, which is just a register of things you want to have done, when you time box, and I didn't make up this technique, it's been around for a long time, it's called setting an implementation intention. It's the most widely studied technique that far too, f too few people use. It's basically saying, here's what I'm gonna do and when I'm gonna do it. Okay, so the issue with to-do lists is that when you write a to-do list and then you tick things off one by one, then you can't plan, firstly, how much time it will take you to complete the task, and secondly, how much attention you actually need for the task. But the idea of traction time boxing is that it lets you track both of these inputs because traction time boxing is basically a fancy way of describing putting stuff in your calendar and like actually doing it. <laughs> I discovered this when I was at university and I realized that I sucked at managing my time and then I started using a calendar and actually just time boxing things and actually trying to plan my week at the start of the week and figuring out, okay, when do I need to allocate time for my essays? When am I gonna work on my side hustle business? That's gonna go in the calendar. And that just helped me really become way more effective with how I use my time. And it wasn't that I was sort of planning every single moment of the day because I also had a very social life at uni and hung out with friends playing board games until four in the morning way too often. But it let me sort of juggle all these different things and it still just amazes me how few people actually use a calendar. When people get into the professional workplace, everyone has to use a calendar because it's how meetings are organized and stuff. But using a calendar for your personal life as well and also using a calendar for any side hustle type goals that you want to work towards, whether that's starting a YouTube channel or a business or even just I don't know, watching the top 50 movies on IMDb, actually just putting those into your calendar and time boxing it really helps you make the most out of your time. And so when you budget those things, your time and attention, the new metric isn't, did I finish? The new metric is, did I do what I said I was going to do for as long as I said I would without distraction? Whether that's being with my family, whether that's playing video games, whether that's working on a big project. Did I do what I said I was going to do for as long as I said I would without distraction? Because that is the only way to have a feedback loop. Now, over time, you get better at estimating how much time and attention these different things in your calendar need, and that way you can keep on improving at it over time. But the most important takeaway is that everything in your calendar should ideally be traction, so actions that pull you towards your goals rather than distraction. Now, sometimes people don't like this. Sometimes people like will say that, well, if you time block everything, then that's like toxic productivity, and like, where's the spontaneity, and where's the fun? And I'm like, no, that's not how it works. You can absolutely time box your evenings, for example, to be fully present with your partner. You can time box a whole Wednesday evening for like a solo relaxation evening, which is what I do on Wednesday evenings. I don't care what your goals are. The thing that I care about that I would love to happen is that you use your time, which is the single most valuable non-renewable resource that we have. You use that time towards things that you actually care about doing. You don't use that time, ideally, just scrolling a random app based on what the like engineers who get paid stupid amounts of money at Facebook and at TikTok and at Instagram and stuff, instead of letting them decide what you're doing with your most valuable asset on this planet. You decide yourself what you'd like to do with your most valuable asset on this planet, i.e. your time. And if that means being on TikTok and chilling out, watching Netflix, watching Disney+, Plus, whatever you want, great, fantastic. As long as you have made that decision, then I'm happy. Cool. Principle number four, the rule of pacts. Okay, so there are three types of pacts that we can use to help become more indistractable. Price, effort, and identity. So firstly, price pacts involve money. Now this part of the conversation, Nir told me about his burn or burn technique when he came to working out. Now Nir used to be pretty overweight and now he's become absolutely ripped. And apparently the way he did this was that he taped a $100 note to his mirror. And when he looked at that mirror every single day, he made a decision. I can either burn some calories by doing some push-ups, going for a walk around the block, going for a swim, doing some kind of exercise every day, to burn calories, or I have to burn the $100 bill. And to this day, Nier has never broken this price pact. And he actually even did the same thing when writing the book, Indistractable. If he didn't write the book by a certain date, then he owed someone $20,000. But of course he managed to write the book and so he never actually had to pay the money. Okay, secondly, we have effort pacts, which is where you put a bit of friction between you and the distraction. So for example, Nier has set it so that his internet automatically turns off at 10 p.m. every single day. Yeah, he could always go and turn the router back on and like unplug the Amazon Alexa switch or whatever the thing is that's turning it off, but that would take effort to do and he has to really think about it and then he has to really think about whether he actually wants to use the internet after 10 p.m. This is the same reason why I've installed an app called Opal, which is very good and I set it so that it blocks all social media apps after 10 p.m. and before 9 a.m. 
So when it gets to night time and I'm sitting on the toilet, scrolling through my phone and I'm like, huh, you know what? I'm just habitually gonna go on Instagram Reels. I can't because Instagram is blocked. And I think, well, what if I just watch a YouTube video? And I can't because YouTube is blocked as well. And then sometimes I think, you know, I should have Instagram unblocked because I need, obviously need to post an Instagram story at 11.30 p.m. And then I go on Opal and then, you know, you can always unblock the apps, but you have to wait like 30 seconds. And in that 30 seconds, I'm like, do I really need to post this Instagram story at 11.30? Well, why don't I just go to sleep? I can wake up early, I can have a nice morning, I'll be a bit more refreshed and energized and stuff. And so I end up not going on social media anywhere near as much as I used to because I've now set this app to automatically block these offending apps between 10 p.m. and 9 a.m. And I'd recommend you do it as well. There's literally no reason to ever allow yourself to even click on a social media app when it's nighttime and your primary goal is to sleep, hopefully. And then thirdly, we have identity pacts. Now, if you give yourself an identity, you are much more likely to actually do something. So using that technique to our advantage, by actually having a moniker, by having an identity. This is why the book is called Indistractable. Indistractable is meant to sound like indestructible. It's who you are. So when you have that, this, this identity, it makes you much more likely to follow through. This comes from the psychology of religion, in fact, that when someone calls themselves a, a member of a particular faith, they're much more likely to, to act in accordance. And reinforcing this identity of being indestructible, this can be your superpower. Now, there's something really cool that I heard from Tony Robbins a few years ago, which is that the strongest force in human personality is the need to stay consistent with how we think of ourselves. So if you define yourself or if your identity is that of someone who procrastinates or I'm a, I'm a procrastinator, then you're going to continue being a procrastinator. If your identity is, oh, I'm a gamer and I have to get through school on the side, then you're going to struggle to ever do your work. If your identity is that of a writer, you are much more likely to write. If your identity is that of a YouTuber, you're much more likely to create videos. If your identity is that of a healthy person, you're gonna go to the gym. And if your identity is that of someone who really struggles to go to the gym or to stay in good shape and work out and stuff, you're gonna struggle with that. This is also something James Clear talks about in Atomic Habits. Identity-based behavior change is a lot easier than focusing on the tactics. It's much easier when you can make your habits consistent with the identity that you wanna have and actually like sigh up yourself into actually having that identity. Okay, so those were the four elements of Nier's indistractability model. You should totally check out the book. It is really good. But if you're maybe struggling with some of these external triggers, like spending a lot of time on your phone, then you might like to check out this video here where I've made a video specifically targeting phone addiction. So thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed the video and hopefully I'll see you in the next one. Bye-bye.